Good evening, folks, and welcome to another story about, what do you guess, Star Wars. Yeah, woohoo. Movie's coming out in a few days. Uh, I believe it's coming out tomorrow in Canada. I could be wrong. Probably tomorrow evening. And uh, definitely the 20th in the States. So all kinds of reporting on Twitter and on various news sites of uh, the reviews that have been coming in. The embargo has been lifted. People hate it. People love it. There's a lot of mixed reviews, a lot of horrible reviews. But, of course, it comes from the foundation that we started with Seven and utterly uh, turned to Ash in Eight. And now, who who the devil knows, Uh, aside from unless you actually read the leaks, which seem to be all confirmed, which is absolutely hilarious. So, I guess you can't really share a secret these days in Hollywood, at least with the biggest franchise ever. So, we go back to Ryan Johnson, because this is where it all sort of uh, started. You know, we could sort of forgive the the blasé effect of Star Wars Episode Seven as being a rehash, but it essentially was what people wanted, uh, just not very well done. Uh, the critic in me would say it was still a bad movie because of the Mary Sue level and the just boring nature. Everything felt like... Uh, deja vu. The, the, the nostalgia was so thick, you just felt like you were revisiting the same movie. Probably not what you want to do when you're trying to bring back a franchise that's beloved for a certain reason. You don't just copy and paste everything. That was J.J.'s style. So we go back to Ryan Johnson here. He says, catering to fans is a mistake. Now, I have a mixed reaction, as I usually do with anything with Ryan Johnson these days. When you write a story, when you want to commit your thoughts to paper, you are doing a largely egotistical action. It's a very selfish action. You're saying to yourself, you know what? I think my thoughts, my, my imagination, my, the world in my head is so important. I think you should read them. You should actually look at this piece of paper or papers and, and, and read how amazing my ideas are. That's what you're saying to the public. So it's ultimately a, a selfish act. And that makes essentially what a writer is, is just a selfish dude or, or girl going, I'm amazing, I'm amazing, I'm amazing, and then that's a book. The other side of that is, well, you have to make this appealing to someone. You can't just make a story about yourself. There's lots of people who make art, whether it's video games or, or paintings or music, who are just for their select group few. Uh, we have a whole bunch online on Discord, in Skype, with uh, best buddies who you share stories with that you don't share with anyone else. But you have to think about the general audience and that you have to say to yourself, I, my, again, my ideas are so great, I'm so selfish, I'm so egotistical, yet I am also a fan of this genre or this series or this sort of plot line or romance or whatever. So you're doing both. You're, you're writing for yourself and you happen to be the audience you're writing for. That's essentially how it is. You can't just write uh, your own flavor of the Grapes of Wrath unless you're adding something new to the table because no one's going to care. Or any other classic film or book or story out there. You have to do something new. And that's why you write. Because you'd be like, why, why am I reinventing The Godfather? Like, what's the point? Haven't we done enough Italian mob stories, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? What what do you bring new to the table? The same with a video game, the same with a painting, any any kind of media. What are you bringing new? It doesn't mean you throw away all your understanding of the genre or genres or whatever you're trying to do. You just have to give that that edge, that selling point, the the elevator pitch that only you yourself have. So let's see what Ryan has to say. Solely catering to, f- catering to fans rather than challenging them is a mistake. I would agree. Solely, just if you're doing just for fan service, that's not really the point. There has to be something special about your thing. If you go to a steakhouse, yes, you want a steak, but you want something good. You want something unique about that steak. Johnson's work on, work on the second entry in the current Star Wars trilogy was met by a wave of criticism upon its release in 2017, with petitions launched to have it remade or removed from the franchise entirely. And for good reason. 
Others criticized some of the film's unexpected plot twists, notably in regards to the parentage of Ray. That was one of <laughs> one of many, many problems. Uh, that plot twist is, I mean, you want to understand why things are happening. And for, for Ryan to just say, I'm not going to tell you, is beating around the bush. You're wasting everyone's time. Why even bring it up? You have to answer questions. You have to answer at least one or two questions about how she's so powerful. Because if you don't, it's just a Mary Sue times two. And she's just going through the motions of, yay, another woman who can't be challenged. Or another character who can't be challenged because she's a Mary Sue. Or he's a Mary Sue. Speaking to the Swing and Miss Podcast on Radio.com, Johnson has now said he rejects writing that automatically gives fans what they want. I would agree as well. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do 100% giving the romance people a, a romance story. You have to do something unique with it. You have to give something edgy, something cool, your own spin on a romance. You can't just regurgitate stuff. I think approaching any creative process with that would be a mistake. It would lead to probably the exact opposite result. Okay, now this is where I, I fundamentally disagree. Like the steak example. If I go to a steakhouse and I get a a ribeye or some cut of beef and it's cooked to perfection, it's seasoned exactly the way I want, I can't complain. There's nothing negative about it. It is an excellent steak. It may not inspire me. It may not, uh, you know, make me write home about the steakhouse being stellar or amazing or or nouveau or anything spectacular in the, in the culinary world, but there's nothing bad about it. It's a great steak. And obviously, steak is a luxury item. You don't go around eating steaks every day. So people go to the theater and go, hey, I want to have a great time. And there are a certain list of rules that make a great time possible within a genre and within a series, especially Star Wars. You got basic stuff in Star Wars. You got the philosophy of good and evil and the conflicts therein. You have that expressed in a lightsaber uh, duel, as well as some sort of space opera or space uh, ship battle scenario. So those are the basics of a, of a Star Wars film. There's other stuff like camaraderie and heroes' journeys and politics and all sorts of other elements of the setting in, in alien worlds. But those are the three major things that I could think of. So if you don't even give us that, Ryan, you've already failed. And yes, he did do a, a, uh, a fight scene, but no two actual... Uh, lightsabers, aside from the dream sequence or the the, the flashback between uh, Luke and Kylo, I don't think they did. They actually clash lightsabers. I can't recall. There was no actual fight scene with lightsabers. And if you're going to do that again, if you're going to subvert our expectations, let's say the example of a steakhouse. Well, guess what? Give us a steak, and 20% of the rest of the protein is going to be veal or chicken or a vegetable or something. You go, whoa! I didn't. I wasn't expecting that but it goes so well with my steak. Wow, I didn't know romance and Star Wars works well together. Wow, what a great idea. See, that's how you do it, Ryan. You give us the majority of what we want, and then the 49% is whatever the heck you want to do, and that better be freaking gold, or we're not going to care. So this is where I, I, I do uh, uh, see the opposite of what he's saying to be true. Even my experience as a fan, you know, I'm, if I'm coming into something, even if it's something that I think I want, if I see exactly what I think I want on the screen, it's like, oh, okay, it might make me smile and make me feel neutral about the thing, and I won't really think about it afterwards, but that's not really going to satisfy me. Now, I don't know what the hell he's talking about here, because if I go into a horror film and I get scared and I go, hey, wow, this isn't boring me, I'm, I'm actually getting involved in the characters that don't act like a bunch of stupid kids from uh, slasher flicks. You know, they, they're actually intelligent. Uh, they're not relying on jump scares. They're, you know, there's a creepy atmosphere. There's enough mystery going on. Hey, guess what? You've done horror right. That's pretty much all I could ask for out of a horror film. And if they do anything on top of that, I'm even more inclined to, to watch this movie again to appreciate further. Very rare to see that. So, this is completely contradictory to what his, his premise is, is that, you know, never uh, give everything to 
the fans. You know, leave some behind for your own input. But the idea that you want to be uh, surprised, that there's a sense of mystery, that's, that's sort of part of every story that's good. There's always some sense of suspense, of stakes, of things that are of value that you actually have to know about and care about. It's not just specific to one genre. Now, there are other writers out there and authors who don't like mystery at all. Uh, and uh, I know Kurt Vonnegut, who's a satirist, he just goes straight to the point. You know, he doesn't waste anyone's time. He says, this is what I'm going to talk about or this is what I'm going to write about. And boom, 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 boom. Every chapter is like fast, fast, fast. It's funny. It's thought-provoking. And he doesn't, he doesn't want to waste your time. He doesn't meander. He's always on point. Not everyone can do that. So you have to know how to write that way. And unfortunately, Ryan is not of that mentality. He's of the Agatha Christie mentality if he is a fan of the Poirot mysteries where the whole point of the story is a mystery. You have to figure out what the plot is. And that's that's a different genre of, of or, and style of writing, which you cannot apply to every other genre or any other genre. It's very specific. He added, I want to be shocked. I want to be surprised. I want to be thrown off guard. I want to have things recontextualized. I want to be challenged as a fan when I sit down in theater. That's great. Most of us want that too. Just not to be 100% shocked, 100% surprised, 100% thrown off guard. We want the familiar. And then once we're given the familiar, we want to be shown the exotic or the unfamiliar. Kind of like, hmm, what does that remind you of? Oh yeah, the hero's journey, which Star Wars was always about. Uh, every man or the layman, as Luke Skywalker was, we all relate. Everyone relates to the guy. He's so relatable. He's just like, well, he's a guy on a farm, wants to get out of there. We get it. I, I wasn't raised on a farm, but I can understand where he's coming from. You see, it's that sort of connection we're looking for. We relate to something. We see it. And now we go away from the natural. We go into the unnatural, into the mysterious, into the exotic. It's, it's, it's almost like painting by numbers because the formula works for a reason. And you use that formula and you tweak the formula. You give a little edge here and there. Maybe you take something out and put it in a different place. Maybe you take it out entirely. Maybe you expand upon the world. There's so many things you can do with the hero's journey and why it works well. And that's what Star Wars fundamentally is as a system in storytelling, a, a form of story. The first reviews of Rise of Skywalker have tended to criticize what has been interpreted as a course correction to many of Johnson's creative choices. That's, that's, uh, that can only be a good thing, honestly. If you can course correct, uh, let's say, the Mass Effect 2 entry into the game series, uh, that would have been amazing. It never happened, unfortunately. But uh, same with The Last Jedi. If J.J. Abrams could do that in any small amount, that is a good thing for the trilogy. These include a greater emphasis on, on action. Okay, not, uh, not exactly a good thing considering uh, the nature of J.J. Abrams and his movies. And a greatly reduced role for the actor Kelly Marie Tran, whose character Rose was at the center of an online hate campaign. Again, nothing to do with the story. Rose was a poorly developed character and a rather ridiculous one. I'd say one of the worst in the, in the well, I don't know about the trilogy, but probably the worst character in The Last Jedi. You know, sacrificing herself to save Finn, which should have killed them both, and then her philosophy is why she did that and how the war is going to be won, was a pile of nonsense. You you don't try to subvert our expectations, Ryan, by creating crap. Okay, you don't try to give us meaning by making no sense, by doing stupid things that are contrived and should result in a logical outcome like death and end up not. And then along with that comes even more nonsense of Finn dragging this this girl back, I guess on his jacket, kilometers away from a war zone in the direction the giant tanks are coming at you and he doesn't get shot down. Very odd, very strange, very stupid. And that's that's just off the top of my head. I'm sure there's many more things with, with Canto Bite I could talk about, which I'm not. Many of the decisions in this film frustrate me. Critic Clarice Lowry wrote in her review of The Independent, 
It hangs several of its predecessors' core philosophies out to dry, and most unforgivable of all, its sidelines roast ego in a way that seems pointedly cruel, considering how viciously treated the actor was in certain corners of the web. Who cares what happens on social media with actors? I don't care. Rose Tico was a useless character who added nothing to the franchise. In fact, her philosophy was insane and stupid. No one would attribute this to war, to a, a victory condition in war or battle. It was what she did, just everything she did, I think, was bad. Uh, why why she, they made her unattractive, why they made her actions unattractive, her philosophy unattractive. Um, it's just contrived melodramatic crap. In many respects, it feels like a betrayal of what came before. You know what? If if uh, JJ could have betrayed The Last Jedi, that would have been a great thing. But uh, I think they mean the betrayal of what came before Episode 7. And interestingly enough, because of all the uh, reviews that have been coming out today, this score on Rotten Tomatoes of 59%, which is currently at 8.11 p.m., uh, this was at 53 once today. It was at 64, I believe. It was jumping up all and down as more and more come in at 205 reviews. So it's it's not looking pretty. Anyway, thanks for listening, guys. I wanted to share this story just because this was an interesting comment by Ryan Johnson. And when I always say to authors, write the story you want to write, not what someone else wants to read. But keep in mind, you eventually are going to have to get someone else to read your story. And if you don't think you're any good at writing, do not commit your thoughts to paper. Thanks for listening, guys. Have yourself a great evening.